heaven. There's so much that could come to our minds and our hearts about what we need you in. And Father, this morning we, we choose and we ask you to, to be with those on the Gulf Coast, Lord, and help them to navigate these storms. We don't know yet, Lord, if they'll just be simple and small or if they'll be outrageous and destructive. But we just pray, oh, Father, as those people will plan and prepare that you would be with them. And Lord, I just pray that there'll be no loss of life because of the, the hurricanes. Father, we pray for our West Coast. Father, we just pray that uh, the firemen and women will be protected. We pray, Lord, that those 560 storm, the 560 uh, uncontrolled fires would be uh, be able to somehow, some way, uh, be stopped, and that there would be no more uh, loss of life. Lord, we just pray for a speedy end uh, to those those storms. Father, let there be weather shifts and things that would help uh, put a close to that. Father, we pray for our nation, uh, where it seems, Lord, that the the national rhetoric so divisive. And we just pray there be a unity in Christ, that we would love, that we'd long for justice, and that we would humble ourselves before you. And that there would be that what the enemy meant for destruction, Lord, we pray that you would turn it for the good. There'd be a national revival and a time for uh, seeking your face. So, Lord, we ask you, Lord, even for the reading of the word today, uh, may your word uh, go into our hearts. So, Father, take down our callous hearts. Take down our our, our opposition to your word and help us to receive the word of God with gladness that we might have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. We thank you, Father, for this, and we pray it in Jesus' name. And all who believe said, amen, amen. So I've got you looking at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5. Um, I told you last week the Lord's been really dealing with my heart, and I wanted to just back up in context and look at 1 Peter 4 briefly before we stand uh, for the reading of God's Word. But in 1 Peter 4, it gives this challenge that, you know, in the last days, there's going to be just all kinds of recklessness, uh, and it's going to uh, just be incredibly difficult and people being incredibly selfish. And, and then it tells us as believers um, that, hey, that's going to be a sign that things are closing up, but in that process, in that time, to be self-controlled, to be sober-minded, and to live and love for others, to show hospitality. And in, in 410, it says, it, and even be aware that you've been given gifts, and to use those gifts, to steward those gifts before God, uh, so that uh, His glory, His grace will be shown to others. And so in, in the the context of what we're about to read, I want you to realize, hey, last days there's going to be difficult times. Last days there's going to be uh, some suffering. It seems like when it comes to believers that suffering is viewed in one of two extremes. One extreme is, I've seen, I've been in services where there's been an altar call. Who's ready to die for Jesus? And it wasn't uh, symbolically. They were ready to lay down their lives. I've seen grown men strong, muscular, come down and just tears down their faces. I'm going to die for Jesus. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm not mocking that except for how many know the Lord would really like for us to live for him every day. Uh, and then if that uh, circumstance happens to come, which is extremely rare in the United States of America, maybe not somewhere else in the world, then he would give us the courage to do that. So I watched those same burly men who would like, ah, take a bullet for Jesus, not treat their wives and children the way God would want them to and not be a devoted disciple of Christ. Does that make sense? So that's one extreme over here. Things are going to be so bad, I've got to lay down my life. And then I've seen the other extreme. It's kind of this sweet mind by, um, well, when we're in Christ, we just won't have suffering. And, it will, you know, we, we claim Jesus, so we get to, we get to tiptoe through all uh, the difficulties and hardships, and because I'm in, hid in Christ, I will never have any problems. How many realize with me that both extremes are just not reality? In this world, you will have tribulation. A famous author said that. Who was it? Jesus. But then he continued to say, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And so what I take away from that is, like we do in 1 Peter 4 and 5, there will be difficulty. There will be hardship. But whenever you're pulled up close to me, you're going to get through that in a way that glorifies the Lord. That's why over and over, we sang about it today, that in our weakness, he shows himself strong. And so as we steward this, uh, we get strength and stamina from the Lord to be servants. 
So if you, if you look at 1 Peter 4, going to be difficult times, um, but you need to be sober, uh, you need to be uh, prayerful, you need to be self-controlled, and be willing to use the gift that God's given you to serve others, and God will give you strength to be able to make that happen. So all of a sudden, our life has purpose, even in the midst um, of the storm. And then he, it's almost as if he closes that again and said, hey, don't be surprised when you have difficulty. Uh, it's not strange. Um, Christ had it. Your other believers have had it. Um, but recognize that God's Spirit will rest upon you, and, and then you, you'll be able to, to carry on. And so I hope that we can come at what we're going to hear today with the echo of that in mind, that there will be suffering, but God wants to glorify himself through that, that he wants to cause us to be sober-minded, self-controlled, being ready to steward the gift that he's given us so that we can serve others, and that he will keep us uh, in, that, in a time of, of suffering and a time of difficulty. So if you're physically able, would you stand with us as we turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning with verse 5. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Father in heaven, we receive your word with gladness. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church and cause us to be the men and women that you have called us to be. Let us fulfill our destinies, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all who believe said, amen, amen. You may be reseated this morning. This passage starts out talking to those that would serve as uh, shepherds or serve as those that serve the congregation, and that they should do so under the authority of Christ, and they should do so uh, receiving direction and even uh, 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 their, their needs met by the Lord. And so that whenever we stand before God someday, that there can be an accountability that says, well, I've done what God would have me to be. And then it says, in the same way um, that we should be submissive to those who are older and that we should uh, uh, be, have humility towards one another. Now, that reminds me of, of Ephesians 5, when we're given the challenge about how the husbands and wives should operate with one another. And most people start with verse 22. And especially if you're male, right? Because verse 22 uh, says something like, hey, wives, uh, be respectful, uh, be submissive to your husbands, right? And that's where we start that verse at. And then it gives uh, three verses about how wives should respond. It gives seven verses about how men should respond. I think men need twice as much instruction as women. That's my takeaway from that. And then it, and it goes on through all that. And it says, most of all, as it closes out that chapter, hey, be sure, uh, men, that you love your wives, be sure, wives, that you respect your husbands. And if that one passage of Scripture could be walked out, there would be no marital issues whatsoever. So that's, our, that's kind of our baseline. But if you go all the way back up to verse 21, it says, submit one to another. How many of y'all been married uh, more than a decade? Raise your hand. You've got a decade of marriage. All right, so I'm going to ask you the question. Is there things that your spouse does that she or he is better at than you are? Of that decade, people, raise your hand. All right, I'm watching. I want to know who to pray for, right? You know, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, when we begin to interact with one another, we recognize all of a sudden that God gives each of us different strengths, abilities. Um, my wife has a discernment level on a scale of 1 to 10 that is like 9.8, all right? Mine's at 2.8, okay? You can walk up to me wearing all purple and say, hey, how do you like my green outfit? And I'm going to think, well, bless her heart's. That must really be green, and I just can't see it, right? I'll just, I'll just believe somebody for what they say. My wife, 
uh, nine times or ten times out of ten, she'll say they're wearing purple and they're out of their mind, right? I mean, it's just she's got discernment, and I'm using that as an example because some of the real life examples are too too painful <laughs> to to admit whenever I missed seeing something. But I'm so grateful uh, for my helpmate. How foolish uh, would I be? to not to listen to her. Now, she's loving this part of the message, so y'all really, y'all really help me out here. But how foolish would I be not to listen when the Holy Spirit gives her discernment about some area? That would be foolishness on, on my part. I can, lunchtime, she is going to repeat this part of the message to me. I can feel it right now in my spirit. So, what, in the same way, I'll have a strength or two that I can bring to the equation as well. When we submit one to another, when we encourage one another, we are better for it. The same thing works in the body of Christ. The same thing works whenever God brings us together with an older believer in Christ who's maybe more mature or has uh, had more experiences. All of a sudden, we are able to then grow and because we are willing to humble ourselves. I want you to know I got over being on a job and being confused and not knowing what to do next and being quiet about it. I got over that real quick. I think I wanted to work when I was 12. I think my first job was the feed store at 13. I'm going to tell you about 14 or 15, I'm the guy that's asking too many questions. You want, you want it where? You want it how? Uh, what tool are we supposed to use? I wasn't afraid to ask questions because I was so over trying to be prideful to act like I knew what needed to be done, only later to find out that I put everything in the wrong place. You know what I'm talking about? In the same way with our walk with the Lord, we have to humble ourselves and say, I don't know how. I, I need your help. We sang about it today, and how many of us, what things that we don't pray about are the things that we're too proud to go to God with because we think, I've got it all figured out. I'm reading a book right now called Sacred Pace by Terry Looper, a very uh, successful uh, businessman that for many decades now has tied 50% of his income. How amazing is that, right? Uh, just God has blessed him to that degree. And he reminded me of Nolan Ryan. He said he makes no decision without taking 24 hours. And then he went further. He said, I don't make uh, 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 purchase decisions without taking a whole week. And then he went further. And he said, I don't make any big changes in business or, or adding or, or subtracting a division without taking a whole year. Why? Because he wanted to slow down. And he calls it get in neutral and hear from God. This is a man who's wildly successful and could probably use his in intuition and make great decisions. But he said, I'm done with that. I need to hear from the Holy Spirit. Are you following me that the, probably the reason that he's able to tithe 50% of his income is that he has humbled himself and now God's exalted him? And even to this day, with all the vast experience he has, with 30 years of having his own business, 40 years of being in the industry, still humbles himself and says, God, I want your direction. We can learn from Terry Looper. We can learn from God's word. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. What will he do? He'll exalt you in due season. Don't point, but have you ever worked for a manager or a boss who got promoted too quickly? Enough said, okay? God, whenever he exalts us, he does it in the due season so that uh, he is the one who gets the glory. He goes on to say, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for us. So the things that, that give us that angst, that's the thing that we cast on him so that he can give us courage. I ask you, I beg of you, don't go to bed uh, with that anxiousness on your heart. Give it to the Lord. Believe that you'll wake up the next morning with his direction. Be self-controlled alert. It's almost like a, uh, a, uh, a reverb of the previous chapter. Remember it said there that he wanted us to, um, to be uh, self-controlled. And what was the other language? It had another S to it. Um, it said uh, when these difficult times come in, uh, in that we should be sober-minded and self-controlled. And the enemy wants to come along and, and get us anxious and, and, and away from the Lord. And he's saying, hey, be self-controlled, be alert. Your enemy goes around like a lion seeking for someone, like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. Some of you need to understand the rules of engagement. You have almost heard him roar and just fall down. You're like those sheep that get startled. You ever seen those sheep? I don't even know what they're called, but you can startle them. Goats, and they'll just fall over like they're, like they're yeah, they're not called sheep. They're called goats, but you can, you can startle them, and they'll just fall over just like they're dead, right? Some of you are acting that way in the spirit realm. The enemy just goes, ah, and you're like, I'm out. No, that's not the rules of engagement. Greater is he 
that is in us than he is in the world. Whenever he goes, we say we resist him in the name of Jesus. And we say, get behind me so that we can be an overcomer. And God's grace will be with us. Will you do your part? Will you resist? I, don't, I know this is taped. And Christy, I'm sorry, but I just have this, this language. Fight like hell. Oh, come on, Pastor. We got children in here. Why are you talking that way? Because that's what's at stake. You know what I'm saying? Don't roll over and watch the enemy have his way with your children. Don't roll over and watch the enemy attack your marriage. Don't roll over and say, well, that's just the way it's got to be. No, fight like hell because heaven's on the line and he will cause you to be more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Don't be that wimpy, namby-pamby Christian who says, I'm not willing to fight. If you ever see a mama get mad, They'll fast and pray. They'll rebuke the devil. They'll get in the word. They'll speak the promises of God over their children. They'll stand in the gap and say, not on my watch. This is not how it's going to go down. I will not accept this. And sir, if those women of God can do that, I believe you and I can step up and say, I will claim the promises of God over my own life. I will claim the promises of God over my wife, over my family, over my future. I will fight like hell is on the line because I know that God, through Jesus Christ, makes us more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. In case you wonder, my kids tease me. Now that they're adults, I guess it's allowed. They said, Dad likes to cuss when he preaches. And I'm like, that's not even fair. It just so happens that hell is real. Are you with me? Say amen. Now what's going to happen next as a result of this, if we will do these things, if we'll operate in this kind of procedure that we've seen in Scripture, that we'll be willing to come under authority, that we'll, be, that we'll have a humility. You know, if there's anything that social media produces for us is to show us how much pride there is out there and how many, how many um, people are so knowledgeable about so many things. Um, <laughs> somebody told me that, that uh, social media is producing miracles. It causes the dumb to speak. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's not, I didn't say that. I just read it somewhere. And, uh, but uh, if we will humble ourselves, God in due season will lift us up. And he expects us to cast our care upon him. He expects for us to be self-controlled and alert. He expects us to fight and resist the devil and not lay down. And then the God of grace will glorify Christ through our lives, and he will do these things. And here's where you're going to need a three-by-five card. The translation that we're reading from says that he will restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. If y'all remember the, the TV program, um, please uh, shout it out. It was a few years ago, and I'm not talking about the cars one, but there was a guy, and some guy might have had a tricycle when he was a kid, and he would bring him this tricycle, and it's all rusted and faded and everything, and he'd bring it to him, and this guy would totally restore it and make it look like it did when he was a kid. And they did vending machines, they did uh, toys, they did, most times it was metal, and they would restore that metal and make it look good. Well, I looked up this word restore, and I want you to know this is the kind of language, it means to bring it back to its appropriate condition. So I have a 1970 F100, and I'm, I'm pretty excited, I'm trying to get Christy excited, but I'm, I'm excited about restoring it. I want to get it back to its appropriate appropriate condition. And the older I get, I think appropriate condition should mean power steering, air conditioning, easy ride, maybe automatic transmission. Anyway, um, pray for the pastor and, and the 1970 F100. But uh, uh, so that re- that's, that's the word. It means to restore, means to bring it back to its uh, appropriate condition. So think about your own life. Sometimes whenever you go through a difficulty, um, I have a, a, an x-ray a month from now, and I am believing by faith that the bone and all of that things that the doctors are expecting to be mended and all that are going are gonna to show a good report. But there's been a, a process, and if you're not careful, it can affect you mentally, spiritually, physically, socially, you know, all, all of those things. Well, rest, so in, in all of us, we may not have gone through a, a hip surgery or a, a broken ankle, but when we go through things, uh, it, it weighs on us and it taxes us, and we need God's 
restoration. Look at somebody near you and say, you need his restoration. Would you say that? You need his restoration. And what we want to experience is the power of God. You know, Jesus told uh, the Pharisees in Matthew twenty two twenty nine. 29, he said, you, you don't know the scripture and therefore you don't know the power of God. Uh, in 2 Timothy, he's, he was telling us in chapter 3, he said, you know, in the last days there's going to be all these folks who do all these things and they're going to have a form of godliness but deny the power. That's the last thing we want to be a part of. We want to experience the power of God. I don't want a religious activity and no power of God. I want us to know the power of God. I want us to experience the power of God. And I want us to understand that he wants to restore you. And in doing so, how he's going to accomplish that is that he is going to uh, uh, strengthen you, uh, make you firm, make you steadfast. So the, the, here's, so you got the word restore. That means to bring it back to its appropriate condition. He wants to strengthen you. Um, now, this means to set fast or to fix firmly, okay? Uh, when you read these long definitions of this original Greek word, it means not only the, the, the main foundation, but everything it controls it. It's kind of like watching a seventh grader lift free weights for the first time, or maybe some of you guys remember that. You've, you've mis- lifted on a machine before, and now all of a sudden you get a bar, and it's not attached to anything, and you're supposed to be doing a bench press, but it starts walking like this and walking like that because you don't have the auxiliary muscles to just have it come straight down and straight back up, and so it's, it's all o- over the map, okay? And some of the coaches are grinning because they have a mental picture of what those skinny arms look like doing that, all right? We don't want to be that way spiritually. We want to allow God, as he is restoring us and bringing us back to appropriate condition, that he strengthens us. So I don't want you to be a strong man of God on Sunday morning and then make worldly, secular decisions on Friday night. Does that make sense? I don't, I don't want you to uh, uh, be like a foolish young person and post a very inspirational scripture on one Instagram uh, and then only uh, a week later show something where, bless her heart, she don't have enough clothes on, all right? Does that make sense? We want to be strong in, in every area. Now, it's easy for us to pick on a, on a teenage girl, but how about, the, how about uh, all of us say we all have to make good decisions in our lives and not be hypocritical and, because it won't cause us to be strong? Now, the next word there that he wants to, so that word uh, strength and establish is, is one Greek word, but it, it needed two English words to be able to get that. Strength and establish, it's one word, and it means to set fast, uh, to fix firmly your main and your auxiliary to make you strong. Then it says to confirm. Now, to confirm, uh, me, and I love this, it means free of weakness, free of disease. You ever had a a winter where you were running hot and strong and long and you didn't get your rest and you didn't get your nutrition and the next thing you know, whammo. Got a high fever, you got a sore throat, you're achy all over and you can't get out of bed and your body's just run down and now you're sick, okay? A lot of doctors will tell you that if you would have got proper rest, would have got proper nutrition, kept your water intake like it should be, and, uh, and, not, uh, and not hug on anybody that had, had stuff, that you'd stay strong. But whenever we run our physical body into the ground, it's not any wonder that we get sick, maybe the common cold, maybe, uh, uh, <laughs> Pastor Kevin says, does anybody get regular sick anymore? You know, to get regular sick, right? Because we, we run ourselves uh, down. Well, in the same way, in a spiritual realm, God wants to, in this process of restoring us, wants to make us free from weakness. Now, let's just be real honest here for a moment. We all have areas that are our, that are our weakness. We all have these opportunities that be, that's our kryptonite, if you'll allow me to say it that way. Draw on some, some Superman here. We all have that area that, oh man, that takes us out. Well, guess what? God's going to give us the wisdom that we need to look to him to be strong in that area and not take in that poison that causes us to be infirm and sick and diseased up and and ineffective. He wants to confirm you. He wants to be able to make you strong. So in that, you have a brother or sister in Christ, and you invite them to be a part of something, and they say, no, thank you. Don't make them say it twice. You can't know that maybe you can go see that film and you have no trouble. 
But that individual, when they see that film, it loads them down with temptation. It loads them down with a struggle. So would you be kind to your brother and sister in Christ? God forbid anybody in Cornerstone would ever take somebody who's a recovering alcoholic and say, hey, come have a drink with me. That would break my heart that somebody would, a brother or sister in Christ, would be a part of causing somebody else to stumble and fall and and perhaps crash and burn. It's a height of foolishness. I'm saying it that way because I think we could all say amen to that. But there are other areas as well that you don't want to entice them to stumble. You want to be iron sharpens iron, where we strengthen one another and we help each other. We want to be a part of the Holy Spirit confirming one another, making us strong, not weak. That last word is the word that says that he would establish us. Now, I really like this word, and I almost feel like it should have been first. Remember, this is all about us restoring to appropriate condition. How many know that you you don't always see the the weaknesses until the stress level is really high up? You ever heard that phrase before? We're all kind of like tea bags. You can look at it. You don't know really what it is until the hot water is applied. And when the hot water is applied, oh, that's chai tea. Hot water is applied, oh, that's that's Earl Grey. You you, kind of get the aroma of that. I've heard it said this way. We all carry a bucket around. Nobody knows what's in our bucket until we bump up against somebody, and then it sloshes out. And we're like, oh, didn't know that was in there, all right? Now, I'm not saying that to condemn us. I'm just saying that it is our uh, litmus test. It's our inflection point. It's our dashboard. All right, some of you aren't getting this. I hate to do this. I'm going to give you a personal example. I had a, a person that I was supposed to forgive. And they had indicated that they would like to talk. And I knew talking meant that they wanted to ask for forgiveness. And I didn't want to forgive them. So guess what I did? I didn't talk to them. What? You, Pastor Ed, of all people. Yeah. And I started acting a fool. I started being uh, short-fused with people. started, uh, ah, you don't need to know all that. Holy Spirit dealt with me, said, have that conversation. And then the Lord gave me strength to be able to offer forgiveness. You hadn't lived long if you would rather throat punch somebody than, than say, I forgive you in Jesus' name. You hadn't lived long, okay? And so I was able, with the help of the Holy Spirit, say, I forgive you. Do you know what happened? I literally had the sensation like I was filled with the Holy Spirit, brand new, all over again. I told a friend who was praying for me that, and they said, you probably were right? That that, that obedience to God. What does that have to do with this? Everything. God wants to establish you. In other words, it means to establish means to lay a foundation. When you see a house being built, they dig piers. What What are they called? The trenches that wind up being the beams. Say again. The footings. Nothing's I've never seen a, a couple that's building a house say, hey, come out and see these, these ditches. What they, it's going to be amazing. Look at these footings. Aren't they amazing? Nobody ever does that. Now, when the concrete's poured, they'll say, hey, bathroom's going to be over here, kitchen over here. But footings, who cares about footings? Only those who want that foundation to last for decades. I don't want you to have a summer camp, mini revival Retreat experience where you're, ain't God good? And the first moment of trouble, you're chicken little. The sky is falling, and I can never get this done. I want you to be established. I want you to be restored to appropriate condition and allowing God to put your footings down because you have determined that he is your source. I just wonder if somebody were to do a study with mental health and time spent in God's word versus social media, if there might be any kind of uh, construct there, you could say the more time you spend on social media and the less time you spend in God's word, the worse your mental health is. And the more time you spend in God's word and the less time you spend on social media, the better your mental health is. I'm just wondering out loud. 
And I know you're looking at me saying, well, that's just obvious. Well, how about we take the obvious and choose this week to change our ways that we might be restored to appropriate condition and allow the Lord to confirm us, to strengthen us, to establish us so that we'll be the men and women of God, stewarding the gifts that he's given us, serving others so that Jesus Christ may be glorified. I think that'll work. And I think our lives will have meaning every day and we'll throw our feet off the bed on Monday morning saying, let's get to it. Devil, you better hide because in Jesus' name, I'm going to go forth and represent him well, slaying darkness and, and, and bringing the light of God's kingdom. Would you pray? Heavenly Father, we love you today. And we are so aware that in our own strength, we cannot. And Lord, we're tired of condemning ourselves of, for not being some kind of super Christian who never has a problem. But instead, Lord, we declare today that in our weakness, you will be made strong and that we will put our trust and our hope in you so that we can be sober-minded and self-controlled. Because Lord, when you come upon us, now we will have what it takes. So I pray over your people. I pray restoration that you would restore them to that divine purpose that you created them for. You knit them in their mother's womb for a purpose and a plan. And I pray, Father, that you would strengthen, confirm, and establish them so that no devil in hell can stop the plans that you have for their lives. I pray that everyone who comes and contact them won't be able to help themselves but smile because they have received blessing from you their spouse, their children, their neighbors, their co-workers. I pray in the name of Jesus that those people will be inspired and encouraged to want you for themselves because they have seen your glory rest upon them. Father, deliver us from pride. From Deliver us from, Lord, that we have all the answers for everybody else to do what they're supposed to do, and yet we don't practice it in our own homes. Lord, we humble ourselves and we say, God, have mercy on us that we might be the people of God that you've called us to be. Father, I pray for any man or woman that's here that has not fully surrendered their lives to you. Father, I don't, I'm not interested in cornerstone people being Christian in name only. I pray, Father, that we'll be Christian, that we have fallen on you for our salvation, for our life, and for our future. Lord, establish us, confirm us, strengthen us, that we might be restored to appropriate condition, that we might show forth your glory. We pray this according to your word, and we pray it in the precious name of Jesus. And church family, now let us pray the way Christ taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.